finally, in this video, we're going to discuss a very interesting class of quantum uh, phenomena that appear in the presence of slow or so-called uh, adiabatic uh, time-dependent perturbations. And uh, such uh, adiabatic perturbations give rise to a very elegant mathematical structure and in particular to so-called geometric uh, berry phase that we're going to derive. Um, so the, uh, this berry phase was um, uh, discovered theoretically by Sir uh, Michael Berry in this uh, paper published in uh, uh, 1984 in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of London. And uh, this is a really very well written and elegant paper. And uh, actually, uh, even though it's a research level paper, uh, which in all, in all likelihood may lead to a Nobel Prize for Sir uh, Michael Berry, uh, you are well uh, equipped to actually understand uh, everything in this paper. So you know, both uh, the derivation and the final results, uh, because it requires nothing but the uh, basic knowledge of single particle quantum mechanics and Schrodinger equation. So we're gonna reproduce part of the derivation uh, in today's lecture in this, in this part. Uh, but um, uh, of course, if you want to know more details, I would like to refer you to the original paper, which again is very well written. So the problem that uh, Sir Michael Berry considered was, uh, well, uh, in retrospect, a very simple uh, problem. So basically it was the canonical Schrodinger equation with some time dependent Hamiltonian. And he uh, assumed uh, two things. Uh, he looked into uh, adiabatic perturbation. That is to say that, so the time dependence in H of T is assumed uh, uh, to be slow. Um, what it means precisely, we are going to define in the next few slides, but at this stage, let's just uh, leave it at that. So we have some very slowly changing Hamilton. And uh, also, um, let's assume that uh, the uh, Hamiltonian uh, returns to uh, itself after a certain period, uh, let me call it capital T. So basically, we have a periodic in time, slow perturbation. And the question that he asked is what happens with the wave function as we get to this uh, at moment of time capital T. So what is the wave function at the final moment of time? So and it turned out that as we will see so that this wave function has a very interesting um, uh, uh, contribution uh, sort of topological or geometric contributions. There are various uh, sort of uh, descriptions of it uh, that appear in the literature. Uh, that was uh, completely counterintuitive and uh, that takes some time to digest uh, even after derivation. So um, now let me formulate the problem that he solved uh, more precisely and proceed to the actual solution of the problem and to the formulation of this uh, theory of the very phase. So let's imagine that we have uh, a Hamiltonian that depends on a parameter lambda. Okay, so this could be a anything. For example, it can be magnetic field, or uh, it can be some parameters of a harmonic oscillator, uh, let's say the frequency or um, something else. So whatever you want to think about. So let's have with some, uh, we have some set of parameters lambda, and we combine those parameters in a vector. So in principle, it could be more than one parameter, and we just construct uh, sort of a vector uh, in the parameter space. Uh, which doesn't have to be three-dimensional, but let me just, for the sake of simplicity, let me imagine that I have a three-dimensional uh, parameter space. Let's say this is going to be lambda x or lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. Okay. And uh, let me consider uh, the situation where uh, this parameter lambda is changing in, in time. So, for example, again, it can be a magnetic field that is changing. And uh, also let me uh, consider the situation where uh, the, uh, if after a certain period of uh, time, uh, capital T, so the parameter returns to the original point. So if this is my parameter space, so basically what I'm talking about, I'm talking about a slow evolution of this lambda such that it starts in a certain point and returns to the same point after uh, time uh, capital T. So, and as I advertised in the previous slide, so what I want to know is what happens with the wave function. So I have some initial condition for the wave function. And um, um, so the Hamiltonian after this period capital T returns to itself. 
So, but the wave function uh, does not necessarily have to return to itself. So, and the question that we're interested in is what happens with this uh, wave function. As a first step in this derivation, let me define precisely what I mean by a slow or uh, adiabatic perturbation. So, what does it actually mean um, that the Hamiltonian is changing slowly uh, with time? And to provide this definition, let me uh, formulate an eigenvalue problem, uh, instantaneous eigenvalue problem for the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian itself is changing with time. So there is no reason for us to write a, a stationary Schrodinger equation, but nevertheless, mathematically, it is well defined. So we can consider at any moment of time t, we can consider an eigenvalue problem for this h of t, and we can find a set of eigenfunctions and uh, the corresponding eigenvalues uh, which I denote as E sub n of t. So for the sake of simplicity, let me actually assume that uh, the uh, spectrum of the Hamiltonian is discrete. So I have just a set of discrete levels. So n equals zero, n equals one, etc. Also, let me assume that the initial condition for the wave function psi at t equals zero is one of the eigenstates of my Hamiltonian at t equals zero. So and for the sake of concreteness, let me actually assume that it's the ground state. So n equals zero at t equals zero. So by the way, it's not necessary really, really for the main conclusions of the derivation, but uh, for the sake of concreteness, let me just be specific. Okay, now um, let us recall what we discussed actually in the previous lecture, in the previous part of this lecture, uh, where we dealt with the opposite case of fast or sudden perturbations. So there we know that if we change the Hamiltonian very fast, the uh, state, the initial state, which in this case is the ground state, would be sort of redistributed all over the place. Uh, so the particle after the quench or after fast sudden change would exist in all possible eigenstates of the new Hamiltonian. And um, in some sense, it's natural to define a slow perturbation as the opposite to a sudden perturbation. That is to say that we will define a slow perturbation uh, such that it does not induce transitions. So basically what happens here is, let's say this is the parameter lambda at t equals zero, and we have our initial state, uh, the ground state uh, with n equals zero. And as I change uh, my lambda, so uh, with time, so these uh, energy levels start to move. So the energy levels really are these solutions to this uh, eigenvalue problem, but the Hamiltonian is changing. And so the uh, energy levels are moving and in principle also the explicit uh, wave functions are changing. So, and what I can imagine happening is that the wave, uh, the particle which initially was uh, uh, sort of confined to the ground state can in principle propagate to all other states. And this indeed will, will happen if the uh, change in the Hamiltonian is fast enough. But if it is slow, and this will be the definition of slow, the um, state of the, of, the, of the system would remain in the instantaneous ground state of my Hamiltonian. And uh, also in this case, if I start from uh, this point in the parameter space, to return to the same point in the parameter space, so at the end of this periodic evolution, basically I require then the system, that the system would remain in the old ground state. And this will be my definition of a slow perturbation. So to mathematically define a precise condition uh, for this to happen requires a little bit of work and I provide this derivation in the supplementary material in the notes. And uh, if you go through this derivation, you will see that the condition uh, for this uh, to happen, for the condition for uh, having no transitions is that the derivative of the Hamiltonian, which is an operator and the matrix element of this uh, dh dt between two states, let's say this ground state and for example, the first excited state, this must be much smaller than the level spacing, the distance uh, between these energy levels uh, divided by the typical time, uh, well, the characteristic time at which the uh, uh, change in the Hamiltonian occurs. So this is uh, the uh, definition, of you if you want, or the co co constraint that we have to satisfy in order uh, for the perturbation to be slow. And one thing that we, um, what we notice here is that, uh, of course, if uh, En minus E uh, uh, of zero uh, vanishes, that is, if the levels cross or if they come very close to one another, so this condition cannot be satisfied because we necessarily will induce transitions between these states.
But if uh, the gaps don't close, if the level spacing remains uh, large enough, and if the change in the Hamiltonian is um, uh, slow enough, so we can satisfy this condition into a good approximation, we can assume that the system remains in the ground state during the evolution. So now we're in the position to actually derive this geometric berry phase, and what it entails is uh, essentially solving the uh, Schrodinger equation, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, under the assumption of the slow perturbation that does not induce transitions. So this is my uh, Schrodinger equation. I'm just writing it down again. And uh, here I'm basically uh, requiring that psi of t remains proportional to the um, uh, ground state. And uh, the only thing I can have here is a phase, right? So because, well, the total number of particles is conserved, so therefore I cannot have here um, any um, coefficient whose uh, absolute value is larger than one because it would imply that the probability to find um, the particle in this instantaneous ground state is larger than one and it doesn't make any sense. So, and I also uh, require that, uh, well, within my approximation, there are no transitions, so the particle remains in the ground state. So there's basically only, only one possibility uh, for this to happen uh, if this coefficient relating the uh, wave function at time t and the instantaneous ground state is a pure phase, either for i phi of t or phi is a real function. So under these assumptions, what remains is to find this uh, quantum phase. I mean, everything else we know, so this is really the remaining unknown in our uh, adiabatic time-dependent problem. And if we plug in this um, form of the solution back into the Schrodinger equation and recall that by definition, this uh, zero t is the instantaneous uh, eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So we will simply get, so basically combining these two, two things will lead uh, to uh, the Schrodinger equation in this form. It will be ih d over dt of psi of t in this form is equal to the energy of the ground state, which is time dependent in this case because the energies are moving around uh, at psi of t. Okay, and um, well, so this um, is no longer an operator, actually. This is just a function. And naively, you may uh, sort of uh, assume that there is a, exists a simple solution to this uh, problem uh, where phi would be equal to sort of a generalization of the usual quantum phase that appears even in the time independent problem. So we could naively just write it as minus one over h bar an integral from zero to t e naught of t prime dt prime. So again, if the Hamiltonian were not to depend uh, on time, that is in this picture would mean that basically lambda is just a point which stays there. So uh, I would just get, get the uh, quantum phase uh, being either for i minus i over h bar energy times time, which is the usual quantum phase that appears uh, in the stationary quantum mechanics. So here, instead, I may just go ahead and integrate from zero to t. Well, it turns out, however, that this is not entirely correct, and there exists uh, an important contribution which appears uh, in, uh, well, to this quantum phase. And let me write this contribution as uh, gamma. And this additional phase gamma that we will derive in a second is uh, exactly what is called the Berry phase. So this is my, our main uh, quantity of interest. While uh, the first part is uh, sort of the usual dynamical phase, it's actually called uh, dynamical phase. Let me denote it as uh, theta with the subscript uh, d, and this is uh, called dynamical phase. If we plug in now back, you know, basically this uh, expression for the phase uh, back into the Schrodinger equation, we're going to get uh, in the left hand side, we're going to get uh, the following term. So there is going to be derivative of e to the power uh, i theta, e to the power i uh, gamma, and uh, there will be the uh, instantaneous ground state, zero t. And the right hand side will remain, will remain the same. 
So in here we have uh, the time derivative, which is going to act on three terms. So they're going to uh, they're going to be three contributions um, in the left hand side. So the first contribution, essentially by construction, is going to cancel out the right hand side. So if we differentiate this exponential, uh, so let me just write it down. It's going to be i h bar um, uh, times i theta d dot times psi, and this uh, theta d uh, dot is uh, um, this uh, the derivative of this integral, which will just pull out uh, the value of the energy. So this whole thing is going to be equal to uh, the energy uh, as a function of time, which will be canceled by the same term in the right-hand side. So there's going to be also uh, another term here. So it's going to be i h bar i gamma dot times psi. And finally, there is going to be um, a derivative of the wave function itself. So the eigenstates are changing. So the Hamiltonian is changing, and so are do uh, the eigenstates. So therefore, there is going to be another term. So let me write it plus i h bar e to the power i um, theta plus gamma. Here we're going to have the derivative of this of this guy. And the right hand side is e naught uh, times psi which, as I already mentioned, is going to be canceled precisely by the first term in the left-hand side. That's why we introduced this dynamical phase in the first place. And now what remains is simply to balance out these two terms. And as you can see, a lot of things cancel out. So the Planck constant cancels out. So the phase factors in this term are going to be canceled by the corresponding uh, phase factors in this uh, wave function. So this goes away and i times i is equal to minus one. And so what we can write is the following. So let's say in the left hand side, we're going to have a, a gamma dot. Uh, the wave function, the ground state wave function is equal basically to this guy, i d over dt, zero t. So finally, what we can uh, do here, we can take advantage of the fact that uh, we have normalized uh, states. So the number of particles is conserved and therefore, and all the, and our particles exist in this ground state. Therefore, this uh, bracket product of this instantaneous ground state with itself is equal to one. And so if we multiply this equation from the left by a bra vector zero t, so we're gonna have simply one in the left-hand side and we're gonna have uh, you know, zero t d over dt zero t in the right hand side. So uh, therefore, what we can do, we can write the the Berry phase, well, this uh, Berry phase gamma, at the time t, as an integral from zero to capital T. So this is the time that it takes the particle, well, the the uh, system to return to the original Hamiltonian. Uh, and um, under this integral, we're going to have zero t d over dt zero t dt so it's, a, it's an integral over time so we get this interesting uh, term which is uh, the berry phase and uh, as we shall discuss in the last slide so this term has a very interesting uh, geometric interpretation that's why it's called a geometric phase to see this, uh, let us recall the definition of these eigenstates, 0t. So those are the instantaneous uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. But uh, per our assumption, so the Hamiltonian depends on time only through the parameter uh, lambda, this vector parameter lambda. So instead of uh, writing these guys as uh, being parameterized by t, we can as well parameterize them by this parameter lambda in this parameter space here. and. Um, if we do so, we can transform this integral over time into an integral over a lambda in this parameter space. And this uh, would acquire a very uh, curious, as I said, geometric interpretation. So almost the last step here is to perform a change of variables and to go from an integral over time to an integral over lambda. And this can be done by simply writing. So here, this d, d, d over dt can be written so this is the identity. It can be written as uh, d lambda uh, over dt, d over d lambda, okay? And on the other hand, when this guy is gonna multiply this differential, so we can simply replace uh, this product 
uh, by uh, d lambda. And so um, another way to write this um, this uh, Berry phase. So let me present it here. So gamma can be written as an integral, and now this integral will go actually uh, around this loop in this uh, parameter space. So it's going to be a closed integral. Uh, so let's say if this contour, we call it C, so it's going to be uh, uh, basically encircling the C. And uh, here we're going to have zero lambda, D over D lambda, zero lambda, uh, D lambda, okay? So this is just um, another way to write essentially the same quantity, but the time is completely gone from our description, even though we started with a time-dependent problem. So here time is not essential anymore. So um, another thing we can do, we can introduce simply a new notation. Let me call it a, a vector notation. A is a function of lambda, which is by definition going to be this guy. And uh, so in these notations, uh, we, can, we can see that the uh, very phase is nothing but a circulation of this uh, potential, if you want, A of lambda, uh, around this contour, okay? So another thing that we can do here, we can take advantage of certain identities um, from the vector analysis, uh, hopefully familiar to some of you who have studied uh, the uh, theory of electromagnetism. Uh, namely, we can uh, define the curl of this uh, vector A. So let's define the curl of A, curl with this respect to this lambda, and let me call it B of lambda. And if we do so, uh, this uh, berry phase gamma can be rewritten as a flux of this, um, I will call it fictitious magnetic field through the area enclosed by this loop that corresponds uh, to this um, uh, quantum evolution. Okay, so uh, essentially, um, well, it's very complicated, but so those of you who, again, who are familiar with the theory of electromagnetism may remember that uh, to describe magnetic field in real space, it's oftentimes convenient to introduce a vector potential such that the curl of this vector potential is the uh, magnetic field. And uh, uh, so here, instead of the real space, we have this uh, sort of fictitious parameter space, which does not have to be a real space. It can be something else. It can be just a set of parameters in our problem. And what we found is that the uh, quantal phase that will be acquired by the wave function as a result of this evolution is essentially a flux of some fictitious magnetic field that exists in this model. Okay. So, by the way, notice that even though we started with the time-dependent problem, this uh, B of lambda and uh, the corresponding uh, vector potential A uh, can be calculated uh, by themselves. So if we just have uh, a Hamiltonian which depends on lambda, whether or not it depends on time is, is a separate matter, we can just go ahead and calculate uh, these uh, properties. And so what we may think about is that uh, when we have a quantum system which is parameterized by some parameter lambda, so there exists an internal, in some sense, fictitious magnetic field in this parameter space. And um, so it exists uh, whether or not we perform a quantum evolution. But if we do perform quantum evolution and if we have this uh, sort of periodic time dependent perturbation, so the quantal phase that will be acquired uh, by the uh, particle is going to be basically the flux of this uh, magnetic field, if you want, through this area enclosed by this uh, uh, loop. And that's why it's called a geometric phase. Sometimes it's also called topological phase. It's a very non-trivial uh, concept. So, uh, I mean, first of all, it was not discovered in the early days of quantum mechanics. It was discovered only in the 80s. And furthermore, only now, and this is basically the subject of current research, we're starting to understand the true importance of this very phase. And uh, one of the recent discoveries that you might have heard about is uh, so-called topological insulators. So sadly, I didn't have time to talk about uh, these um, quite amazing discoveries, but I just wanted to mention them in passing to um, sort of emphasize that this is not just a pure mathematical construct, which is sort of elegant by itself, but also it does have important physical applications. And this is the subject of current research.
So the final thing I'm going to mention here, uh, sort of concluding this technical discussion, is that unlike uh, the magnetic field in real space, which uh, does not have uh, sources or sinks, so there are no monopoles as we know, so the divergence of the magnetic field is zero, so this fictitious magnetic field uh, actually uh, can have sources. And uh, these sources uh, are, well, some sort of monopoles in this parameter space correspond to the degeneracies uh, in the spectrum of the problem. So what it actually means is, uh, and this is one of the results uh, uh, understood uh, by Barry in his original paper, is that if we have some uh, values, some special values of parameter lambda, let's say call it uh, lambda star, such that um, there exist uh, two, uh, there may exist two wave functions with the same energy. So basically the energy levels cross. So then um, these points, let's say this point, uh, serve as uh, sources or monopoles of this uh, magnetic field. So uh, in, in this parameter space, this is also a very interesting uh, result. Well, it's a very interesting subject. I could definitely talk more about it. It's a very exciting field, but um, I feel that I probably should stop here because I've been talking uh, for 25 minutes now in this last part of the last lecture. And I just would like to thank you very much for your attention. I hope that this lecture and in general the course um, were interesting and useful, at least some parts of it. And uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you very much.